Cuba's President Miguel Diaz-Canel received his Iranian counterpart, Ibrahim Raisi, in Havana as the Persian head of state pays an official visit and concludes his Latin American tour. In Argentina, 60 days before the simultaneous and mandatory open primary elections known as PASO, which precede the presidential elections contesting parties' form alliances. A delegation of the International Atomic Energy Agency, headed by its Director General Rafael Grassi, arrived in Zaporizhia to inspect the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. The Cuban president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, received on Thursday his Iranian counterpart, Syed Ebrahim Raisi, who traveled to the Caribbean country as part of his Latin American tour. At the Palace of the Revolution, both highlighted the historical ties between the peoples and the governments of Cuba and Iran. Hours earlier, the Persian leader made a brief speech at the Cuban-Iranian Business Forum held in Havana, in which he stressed that his country and the Caribbean nation have achieved great progress in the field of te biotechnology and can also cooperate in areas such as energy generation, mining and technology exchange. Raisi noted that the joint creation of a vaccine in the COVID-19 pandemic was a symbol of cooperation between Iran and Cuba. Syed Ibrahim Raisi arrived the day before on the island, the third and last destination in the Latin American tour of the Persian president, who is traveling at the head of a high-ranking delegation with the aim of strengthening political, economic and scientific cooperation in line with his government's foreign policy. And strengthening political, economic and scientific cooperation in line with the foreign policy of Iranian government is among the objectives of the visit of the Persian leader. The trip is a continuation of the actions carried out last February by the Iranian Foreign Minister José Amir Abdullahian in Havana, scenarios in which he exchanged with senior officials of the three countries and explored the fields of cooperation between the three. In May 2022, the Cuban Deputy Prime Minister Ricardo Cabrizas had meetings with the highest Persian authorities, including the, per the president and the foreign minister, in which both sides confirmed the fraternal relations between the two countries. In more than four decades, Iran and Cuba have signed and consolidated agreements and exchanges in areas such as the transfer of biotechnological products, nanotechnology and the pharmaceutical industry and food safety. And the presidents of Nicaragua and Iran announced on Wednesday the signing of important agreements between the two nations. The announcement was made at a press conference held by both leaders in Munawa during the official visit by the Iranian President Ebrahim Raisi to the Central American country. The President Ortega informed that three memorandum of strategic importance for both nations have been signed. According to Nicaragua's Vice President Rosario Murillo, the agreements provide greater opportunities for fraternal development, solidarity and and social justice based precisely on scientific and technical cooperation. And in that moment, the Nicaraguan president talked about the will that both countries have to talk about topics of interest. We are here, and uh, it is very clear within these subjects that, that there is the will. There is the will to, to talk about the subjects that are already, uh, already deal with. During the press conference, the president of Iran, Ibrahim Raisi, stated that the resilience of the people has had a significant importance. There have been military interventions and as well the threats, the threats, the sanctions, are there measures, are the measures that it is in order to freshen the sanctions. But, but the persistence, but the persistence of the people and the search for, search for independence, for freedom, neutralizes, neutralizes, amazing stop and setback. 
We move on to other topics. The Association for Justice and Reconciliation in Guatemala rejected the registration as a presidential candidate of Suri Rios Sosa, the daughter of dictator Efrain Rios Montt from the June 25th elections. In this sense, families of the victims killed during the war strongly rejected Rios Sosa's candidacy, arguing the participation of the dictator's daughter offends the dignity and the memory of the exil Maya people indigenous to Guatemala. Suri Rios father gave orders to kill, torture, rape, and disappeared more than a thousand exiles, and acknowledged as much as in 2013 in a court of law. Meanwhile, the Electoral Authority accepted Rios Sosa's registration, while vetoing several alliances, among them the one made up of a representative of indigenous people. On Thursday, the Uruguayan government has taken the responsibility for crimes committed during the 1973-1985 military dictatorship. The Inter-American Human Rights Court has found the Uruguayan government liable for the assassination of three young women, usually referred to as the April Girls, Silvia Reyes, 19 years old, and pregnant Diana Maidanik and Laura Raggio, and for the disappearance of two other men, Luis Eduardo González and Oscar Tassino. The Uruguayan government has been found guilty of not properly responding to requests for access to information, and it has been sentenced to take on reparation measures that include continuing the inquiry, providing psychological support to the victim's relatives, and publicly acknowledging their responsibility. The government has bowed to demand for military authorities to clarify the whereabouts of those who disappeared before and after the coup d'etat of June 27, 1973. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find the news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. On Thursday, in the United Kingdom, a committee of lawmakers, after a year-long investigation, declared that the former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson deliberately misled the Parliament about the party blockade. The House of Commons Privileges Committee report concluded that Johnson's actions and his response to the committee constituted a such a flagrant breach of the rules that they warrant a 90-day suspension from Parliament. Although a damning indictment for the former Prime Minister's conduct, the recommendation is largely symbolic because Johnson angrily resigned as a legislator on Friday after the committee informed him of its findings. The report also said that they have concluded that, by misleading the House, Mr. Johnson Johnson committed gross contempt. In the United Kingdom, there is no precedent for a prime minister being found guilty of misleading the House. In Greece, the death toll of the shipwreck of their costs rose to 79 on Thursday, while rescue efforts remain fruitless. Authorities warned that many people could still be missing at sea, while reports suggest there were as 750 people aboard the vessel. The country's Coast Guard has been criticized for not intervening earlier, but authorities say their offers of help were rejected. Rescue teams continue to score the seas of Greece in a massive search operation as hopes of finding more survivors dwindle. Doctors who have been treating victims have reported the presence of a large number of women and children in the ship's hold. Greek Prime Minister Johannes Stormas has declared three days of national mourning. The Serbian president, Aleksandr Vucic, on Thursday urged the Western leaders to stop Kosovo's regional authorities and prevent a new war in the Balkans. The Serbian president accused the prime minister of Kosovo, Albin Kuri, of trying to provoke a war at any cost. After the closure of the border that prevents the access of Serbian citizens to the place, the head of state warned that the Kosovo principal or provincial authorities cannot ban the import of Serbian products, a maneuver that seeks to starve the people, as he asserted. 
ordered. Serbian president also denounced Tuesday's arrests of two prominent Serbian citizens, whom the self-proclaimed republic accused of organizing the attack on NATO peacekeepers in May. Vucic also accused the European Union and NATO of doing nothing to persuade Kuri, despite having received assurances that there will be no arrests. Now we move on to other topics. On Thursday, the delegation of the International Atomic Energy Agency, headed by its Director General Rafael Grassi, arrived at Zaporizhia to inspect the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. According to reports issued by the Russian authorities, the checkpoint of the city of Energodar was passed without incident. Russian authorities also confirmed that Grassi and his team have already started the field inspection. Grassi met on Tuesday with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and delayed his trip to the plant by one day for safety reasons. This is the third visit of Grassi to the nuclear power plant since September 2022. The International Atomic Energy Agency presented to the Ukrainian President an assistance program in view of the reduced water flow in the Kakova Reservoir next to its own ponds for cooling after the dam was blown up more than a week ago. On Thursday, the spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia, Maria Zaharova, declared Moscow's commitment to avoid a nuclear war. Speaking at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, the top diplomat said that Russia is fully committed to the principle of inadmissibility of nuclear war, since there can never be a winner in it, and therefore it should not be started. Furthermore, the spokesperson stressed that the Russian policy in the sphere of nuclear deterrence is limited to exceptional circumstances in the framework of pure defensive objectives. Meanwhile, the 26th St. Petersburg International Economic Forum will be held from 14th to 17th of June 2023. And the leaders of six African countries have left from different parts of the continent for Ukraine to mediate in the war between Moscow and Kiev. Led by the South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, who will welcome the Russian President Vladimir Putin in a few months, the heads of state of Egypt, Senegal, Congo, Uganda and Zambia left for Poland to continue by train to Kiev, the Ukrainian capital. Last week, the South African President had a telephone conversation with the Russian President to whom he informed about this peace mission. The African leaders claimed that the Ukrainian conflict has been devastating for their economies. And Tell Us What English continues to grow. You can now tune in from 33 different African countries using Storsat. Dial 461 and enjoy our Latin American alternative broadcast. One final short break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. An earthquake of magnitude 6.2 has been recorded in Mindoro province in the northern Philippines with no immediate reports of damage. According to the United States Geological Survey, the quake struck at a depth of 126 kilometers. No casualties or major damage were reported after the quake, though Philippines authorities halted operations on three elevated railway lines in the capital Manila as a precaution. However, the state seismological agency warned of aftershocks but ruled out tsunami waves due to tremors depth. Meanwhile, tremors from the quake were felt in the capital, which is about 100 kilometers away, as well as in nearby provinces.
And a new incursion by Israeli troops into Palestinian territory leaves one dead and two wounded. The deceased young man was identified as Jalil Jayai Alanis. He died in the hospital after receiving several gunshot wounds while confronting occupied troops attempting to demolish more houses in Nablus. The Red Crescent confirmed two more gunshot wounds and at least 170 people poisoned by tear gas. The Islamic resistance movement Hamas condemned the killing of the young man and the Nazi behavior of Israel in destroying the house of Osama Tawil, a Palestinian prisoner. And the governor of West Darfur state and the head of the Sudanese alliance, Kamis Abdullah Abkar, was killed on Wednesday, two months after the start of the armed conflict between the Sudanese army and the rapid support forces in Khartoum. Kamis' assassination came two hours after a telephone interview with al Hada TV, in which he accused the rapid support forces and Arab army militias of killing civilians in the capital city of West Darfur state. In the interview, the regional representative appealed to the international community to intervene and protect civilians, stressing that the Sudanese army and the joint forces of the Darfur army movements were unable to intervene to protect them. Soon after, sources reported his arrest by the rapid support forces following his television statements. And the government of Egypt has applied to become a member of the BRICS group comprising Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. According to the Russian ambassador in Cairo, Gorgi Borishenko, the request was issued given that one of the initiatives currently being carried out by the BRICS is to convert trade to alternative currencies as far as possible, whether they be national currencies or the creation of some kind of common currency. The official explained that Egypt is interested in such an initiative with a view of reducing its demand for dollars. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.